everything that we can claim as believers. Every promise of God, every prayer that we offer up, if it weren't for the blood of Jesus, it would be for nothing. I mean, thank God, this is, this is the, the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ is everything. If we don't have nothing else, if we don't have nothing else, if we don't have the epistles, if we don't have all the stuff, I mean, that's, that's all important, it's all God's word, but if we don't have nothing else, that's enough. That's enough to make us want to lift our hands up and say, thank God. Thank God for your mercy. Thank God for your grace. That you can save a sinner like me. <laughs> thank the Lord. Thank the Lord that, thank God for your mercy and grace that you could put up with us. <laughs> Anybody? Okay. <laughs> God, you put up with us. Tonight, we, we're just going to read a little bit and talk a little bit. We're not going to be here long tonight. But I just wanted to read. Uh, you know, when Jesus was on the cross, he said so many things. I know we've all heard uh, messages about the seven words from the cross, the seven last words. And uh, what a lot of folks don't know, and I think a lot of you do know, but what he was saying were things that were from the Old Testament. He was, he was quoting Scripture. And uh, one of the, what I want to do tonight, I want to read, just read a little bit. I want you to turn with me to the 22nd Psalm. And we're going to read that, and then we're going to look at a passage after that, and then, and then we're going to go, go dismiss. But this, this psalm, if, 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 everybody's familiar with the 23rd Psalm. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. But what's interesting to know is Psalm 22, 23, and 24, they're a, they kind of go together. They're all messianic psalms. They're all pro- prophetic of the Messiah. The 23rd Psalm, of course, is Messiah, our shepherd, the good shepherd. The 24th Psalm is Messiah, our king, who is this king of glory. It's the Lord strong and mighty. The Psalm 22 is Messiah, the sufferer, Messiah, the offering, Messiah, the sacrifice. Because the anointed one didn't just come to be our shepherd. He didn't come to be our king, only that. He came to be our sacrifice. He wasn't a martyr for a cause. He didn't want to start a revolution against the Romans. He didn't want to, want to start a new society. He came for one purpose, one purpose only, to save sinners. He came to be the offering, the sacrifice, the only one that would be acceptable to a holy God, to be able to accept us through faith, that we could be accepted by him. In Psalm 22, we're just going to read and follow with me. You're going to hear a lot of things in here that will ring a bell, that will sound familiar. This was written maybe over a thousand years before Christ was here, yet some some, uh, scholars and some folks that have a lot of letters after their name, they believe that Jesus might have quoted this whole thing on the cross. He might, have, he might have sung this psalm to the Father. Because this was prophetic, King David. Maybe he didn't realize what he was prophesying, but he was prophesying the things that we read about in Christ, that Christ fulfilled, or that were fulfilled, a- apart from his, his ability to do so. Let's just read a little bit tonight. He begins by saying, My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? The eternal Son of God that was forever with the Father in glory, for a time sensed the separation of sin. He didn't become a sinner, but he took our sin. He said, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring, you know, when Jesus was in the garden, he said, Father, if it were at all possible, I can't imagine what, was, was, what he was facing when he was realizing he was going to actually feel guilt. Something that would be so totally foreign to him because he had never sinned. Yet he was going to sense the guilt. We think of the, 
the pain of the beating of the cross and, and so forth. But I don't think that's what he was agonizing over. I think he was agonizing over the fact that he who knew no sin was for the first time in all of eternity going to sense the guilt of sin. He says, my God, I cry in the daytime and you don't hear me. And in the night season, and I'm not silent. But you are holy, O thou that inhabits the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you did deliver them. Stiff-necked, stubborn people coming through the wilderness, kept turning their back on God, kept uh, worshiping idols, kept going against God's law, yet God still was faithful to deliver them, to send a judge or a deliverer, to send them into captivity for 70 years, to bring them back, not to punish them, but to bring them back. He said, they cried unto you in verse 5, and were delivered, they trusted in you, and were not confounded. But me... I'm a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people from Isaiah chapter 53. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, He trusted on the Lord that He would deliver him. Let Him deliver him, seeing He delighted in him. I wonder if those scribes and Pharisees who were saying that stuff realized they were fulfilling prophecy. It was written a thousand years before that. It says in verse 9, But you are he that took me out of the womb. You did make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from the womb. You are my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. All his disciples left him. They all abandoned him. They all ran. The only one that was sticking around was John and the women. But all the other ones, man, they took off. Peter, who was going to be big and brave and go, to, uh, and go to prison for him, ended up running and hiding. He says, many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I wonder when Jesus was hanging on that cross and he was looking out and he saw the Roman soldiers and he saw the Pharisees and he saw the ones who were mocking him. Here is surrounded by these people who were, who were dogs, Gentile dogs. He says, I'm poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowel. Here he is, pouring himself out, describing what it's like to hang on that cross. He says, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. They, my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you have brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They've pierced my hands and my feet. I wonder if the Roman soldiers knew they were fulfilling prophecy when they were pounding the nails. I may tell all my bones that they look and they stare upon me. They part my garments among them. Did somebody tell those Romans, hey, listen, yeah, listen, when you get a chance, just so you can fulfill Scripture, why don't you bet on his robe? He says, they part my garments among them. They cast lots upon my vesture. But be not far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. And by the way, that word unicorn in the King James, it's, it's like a rhinoceros or, or an animal with one horn, so don't let anybody get, you know. They have a, some of them have a field day with that one, but that's it. Listen to what he says. All this suffering, all this pain, being rejected, being mocked by everybody, feeling like he was separated from the Father. Yet he says this, I will declare your name unto my brethren. 
See, Jesus knew that that cross wasn't the end. He knew that that wasn't the end of his life. He knew that the time would come when he would be declaring the glory of God amongst those, the very ones that ran and deserted him. He was going to show himself in the midst of them. He was going to teach them things. For 40 days after his resurrection, he taught them. He prepared them. And then, at 50 days after his resurrection, the Holy Spirit was given. He says, I'll declare your name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. You that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel. From hanging from the cross, can you imagine Jesus saying this to these very people that had neglected him, the very city that he wept over uh, on his way into Jerusalem. He's saying, listen, praise the Lord because God's not done with you. He says it to us. You see, we sang a song, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? We were all there. We were all there. You might say, man, I'm not even, I'm not even 50, 60 years old. We were there. Because when we hung that, on that cross, we were there. It was for us. And for our children and our children's children. Unto all ages. We were there. He says, you that fear the Lord, do you, is anybody here that fears God, praise him. You, the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. See, again, I've said this before. A lot of folks think God was all upset because Jesus was hanging on that cross. He was glad Jesus was on the cross. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, said in Isaiah. It, it, was a, it was a sweet savor. It was an offering. Every, every place in the Old Testament where they talk about sin offering, where they would take an, a, a lamb or a ram or whatever was prescribed in the law, and they would offer it, it says, says it over and over and over again. It's a sweet savor in the nostrils of God. When Jesus was hanging on that cross, that was the greatest, best offering that anybody had ever made. God wasn't weeping. He wasn't crying. He wasn't moaning. He was saying, yes. Yes. He was like, man, yeah, okay. It says, he has not despised nor bore the affliction of the afflicted. Neither has he hid his face from him. Even though Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Still he knew that God had not hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. Sometimes when we go through the worst things, the worst times, sometimes when you feel like you're being crucified and it feels like God ain't hearing, listen, he's hearing. He's listening. He's listening. When you cry out, when you have your, everybody here has at one time or another had a Gethsemane. Maybe some of you have got one going right now. Everybody in here has been to Calvary at one time or another. You know when you cry out and sometimes it seems like God's not hearing, he's hearing. Jesus said, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yet he knew that his ear was open. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. Verse 26. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. See, Jesus, you know, when we take communion, we always say, like, we look back to what he did, and we, we, and we look forward to what he's going to do. Well, Jesus was hanging there on the cross. He was talking about where he was, but he's looking forward to the time when all the world will worship God. All the world will worship the Lord. Because of what he's doing right here. He says, my praise shall be of you in the great congregation. I'll pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied, in verse 26, and shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. Your heart, listen, you're going to live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nation shall worship 
before thee. See, Jesus knew the, the end. He let us know the end. This word tells us what the end is going to be. This prophecy given uh, a thousand years before Christ is really prophesying things that haven't happened yet. There's going to come, come a time when this suffering Messiah, if you go over to chapter uh, Psalm 24, when he marches in, they're going to say, who is this king of glory? He's going to return as the conquering king. He's going to return to set up his kingdom on this earth. In all the ends of the world. Will turn to God. They're all going to worship Him. It's going to be hard to get a flight to Jerusalem because all the all the folks of the world are going to come and worship Jesus Christ. They're going to worship Him. They make a mockery of Him now. Now nobody cares about Him. But there's going to come a time when all the leaders, all the nations, are going to come to Jerusalem to bow at the feet of the anointed King. He says. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. Now, it's not the United Nations. He's, listen, God is in control. He's in control right now. Somebody say, man, well, the, the mess is going on. Listen, God knows everything is going on. He knows what's going on behind the closed door. You can erase your emails all you want. God knows what, God knows what you put in them things. All they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Listen, they shall come and shall declare his righteousness. Back there in verse 22, Jesus said, I will declare thy name, and we're going to declare his righteousness. Jesus declared his name on that cross. So that we can declare his righteousness. That's what Good Friday is about. That's what the crucifixion is about. I don't think he was crucified on Friday. It doesn't matter. He was crucified. There shall come and shall declare the righteousness unto a people that shall, that shall be born that he has done this. Now, that psalm is a prophetic psalm about what Christ was going to do and what he did. I want you to turn with me to one more place, and I'm, I promise I'm not going to keep you much longer at all, but over in 2 Corinthians, I want you to turn with me in the New Testament. Because I kind of like to bring, always bring things to the new. And, and, and verse, chapter 5. And... Uh, Starting at verse 14. See, we, we want to get the other side of it. Ch chapter, Psalm 22 was, was Christ on the cross. We want to get the result of the cross. Because the package deal is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not just the death. If you leave the resurrection out, then it's just a martyr. It's not just the resurrection, it's the blood. If it's, if it's not, if it's not the, that package deal, then the resurrection is just a fairy tale. But he died for our sins, was buried, and was raised again. And listen to what Paul says. For the love of Christ constrains us. Here was, here was, guy, here was a guy who was probably one of the ones who was mocking Jesus. We don't know that for certain, but we know he was a Pharisee. He, we know that he uh, was there at the first Christian martyr, Stephen. So he, he was part of the Sanhedrin. So he was probably there when they were saying crucify him. He found out about the love of Christ. He found out about who, who he really was. And Paul knew the word. He was a Pharisee. He was studied. He understood the Old Testament. When he met Jesus on that road to Damascus, he said, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm the anointed one that you're persecuting. Paul said, the love of Christ, I man, I hope you all got the love of Christ in your heart. It constrains us. It forces us. It, it binds us in because we thus judge that if one died for all, the reason why Jesus went to the cross, the reason why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because we've all forsaken him. 
He died for all. If one died for all, then all must be dead. We were dead. Dead men walking. And that he died for all, that they which live, are you alive? Should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them. That means that if we own him as our Savior, we ought to be living for him. How much, how much do we give him? So I have to, I, 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 I'm convicted. I'm convicted. How much time do I give him? How much time do I give to? I mean, there's some things we've got to give time to. You know, there's some things we've got to deal with. But how much of my time do I spend talking to him, praying to him, reading And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we know him, uh, we know him like that no more. What he's saying was, listen, we're not talking about personalities here. We're talking about the Spirit. We're talking about what he's done. Therefore, in verse 17, here we go. Death, burial, resurrection, Sunday morning. I want to praise the Lord for the resurrected Christ. I'm glad he's still not dead. I'm glad he didn't stay in that tomb. If any man be in Christ, are you in Christ tonight? You're a new creature. You're a new man, a new woman. You're new, born again. You must be. Born again. Not in the flesh. Can't crawl back in my mother's womb and get born again. I can't redo that. I'm not going to be reincarnated as somebody or something else. But he's talking spiritually. I need to be a new man. He says if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. This is why we celebrate the cross. This is why we celebrate the crucifixion. Because if it wasn't for that, I'd still be my old me. He said if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. And all things are of God who has what? Reconciled us. When Jesus went to that cross, he was like God when he killed them animals and took in bloody skins and covered Adam and Eve to cover their nakedness. Jesus Christ died, shed his blood to cover us so that when God sees us, he won't see a sinner, but he'll see a sinner saved through faith in Jesus Christ. A new man. Cleansed, clean, holy, righteous. He says, He's reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And not only has he done that, but guess what? He has given us the ministry he wants us to tell somebody else about. That God was in Christ when he was on that cross. Saying, quoting from Psalm 22, when they were betting for his garments, when they were, they were cursing him and mocking him and, and making fun of him and calling him all kinds of names when they were spitting at him and beating him with whips when they were doing all those things listen God was in him he was in Christ he was in the anointed that offering that sacrifice God made the offering of himself he offered himself if you read in the book of Hebrews he became our high priest he became the sacrifice he became our intercessor he became everything That God was in Christ, in verse 19, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, or not keeping a record of their sins, thank the Lord, and has committed unto, uh, 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 and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, when we, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Okay, For he has made him. Here we go. This is really the end of the matter. He's made him. When he hung on that cross on Good Friday or Thursday or Wednesday or whenever it was, and he hung on that cross, you know what? He made him to be sin for me, for you. Why do we celebrate? Why, I mean, why, why, do we, why do we lift our hands up and say, Thank you, Lord? 
It's just a, it's just a church thing and we get together and have fun. No. If I was the only one standing here, I'd lift my hand up and say, God, you died for me? You took my... He, he became... He didn't become a sinner. He didn't make him to be a sinner, but he made him to be sin. He was every lamb, every, every sin offering, every trespass offering, the thousands or millions of animals that were killed and shed their blood from the time of the giving of the law until the time of the crucifixion of Christ. All those animals pointed to one final sacrifice. Because the blood of bulls and goats and rams was only a temporary thing. But Jesus did it once for all. They were just representative. They were just, they were just innocent victims, as Jesus was an innocent victim. For he has made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's it. Take away all the theological stuff and all the big words and everything. I'm righteous because he took my sin. Somebody said, I seen you last week. It wasn't acting righteous. No, listen, God sees me. You might say, well, man, you don't know what I did last week. I wasn't acting righteous. I'm not talking about how you're acting. I'm talking about how God sees you. He imputes to you the righteousness of Jesus. <laughs> so why do we celebrate the crucifixion? Shouldn't we be mourning and say, I, I, I grew up, and I, I had a wonderful grandmother who was... Uh, you know, they were, they were Catholic, and she would weep. You know, they would, they, would, they, would, they would come around Easter time, they would show movies about Jesus being crucified, and she would cry and weep, and she was, oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I wish I would have known better. I could have said, hey, Grandma, you ought to be clapping. You ought to be putting your hands together. I mean, she was a dear woman. I don't, you know, she, she loved Jesus, and yeah, that's all she knew, you know. But I, I would say, Grandma, I said, you ought to, you, don't be crying. Don't be sad. You ought to rejoice. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Oh, no. Tonight's not a night of mourning and weeping. Tonight's a night of celebration. Because my God sent somebody to be sin for me, to pay the price for me, to shed his blood for me, to pay, to be the offering, to make a sacrifice that would satisfy the demands of the law that I could never do. Jesus did it. See, and, and it's great because there's that famous, that old famous uh, uh, preacher, I forget who it was, it, you know, it may be Friday night, but Sunday's coming. You know that one, that one, that guy named Carmen, the singer, said, it may be Friday night, but Sunday's coming soon. Not me. <laughs> Same name, but it, not me. <laughs> That's all right. I, I, I know sometimes I used to think that, uh, like they sing in that song, well, the devil was having a party. You know, I don't think the devil was very thrilled to see Jesus go to that cross. Mm -mm. Any other way, maybe. But he knew what it was. Because when he went to that cross, he defeated death. He beat death. It said he descended into Hades, hell. Not the lake of fire. The lake of fire is empty. Ain't nobody there yet. But in that place called Hades and a place called Sheol in the Old Testament, the grave, there was a place where they had, where they had the, the righteous dead called Abraham's bosom. You all know that story? When there was this, the, 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 the poor man and Lazarus before the cross, they both died, uh, or the rich man and Lazarus, a guy named Lazarus, not the same one that was raised from the dead, but a beggar. He, he died, and he went to a place called Abraham's bosom, or paradise. That was, that was a part of hell, Hades. It wasn't a place of torment. It was a place of paradise. There was another section there where it was a place of torment. That's where the wealthy man, in the blue chapter 16, you can read the story. And there was a gulf fixed. And there was a place of torment over here where people who, who had died without knowing God, uh, without faith, they ended up there. And, and those who had faith, uh, they ended up over here. When Jesus died, you know, you know where he went? He spent three days in the tomb, but you know where he went? 
He descended into Hades, hell. And, and he didn't go down there to be tormented. Take that out your mind. People say the devil's tormented. There ain't no devils in hell. <laughs> they don't want to go down there. He went down there. But you know what he did? He went to that place called paradise. All them righteous saints in the Old Testament, they, had to go to, they couldn't go in the presence of the Father because their blood had not been offered yet. But when Jesus offered his own blood and became the high priest, he went down in that place and he said, come on, boy. And he took him with him up into the presence of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> so now, those folks down in torment, they're, so, they're, they're waiting for the time when they go in front of the great white throne. But I thank God that Jesus, when he was on that cross, the last thing he said was, it is finished into thy hands. I commit my spirit. That's a victory cry. He won the victory over death and the grave. Hallelujah. So I don't have to worry about where the undertaker's going to put me if I die. I don't really care where they bury me. They could bury me under Catalpa Street. If they, but I really don't care. Because when the trump sounds... The dead in Christ are going to rise. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Why? Because on, on that night when he was crucified, that day he was crucified, he gave up his life, became sin for me, that I might be the righteousness of Christ. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap. He's worthy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. Won't you stand? We're going to close and send you all home. And Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as... Let me ask you this. Are you afraid to die? Nobody likes to think about it. And nobody likes to think about the idea of having to say goodbye to somebody they love. But are you afraid to die? You don't have to be. You don't have to be. Because death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. There's another song we sing, John. George, could you come up here in... You don't even have to plug in, but just in the key of D. In the key of D. Just, just, just give me a D chord, and I know, you, I know you know it. I know you know it. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Victory, hallelujah. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever.